Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. Now we've plenty on the show for you today, but one of the things that I need to flag early with you is that William Smith from City Vets is going to be here answering questions about your pet's health. So get those questions in early uh, to 0833333975 so I can put as many of them uh, as I possibly can to him while he's here. Um, you can also call 0518461123 if you want to get your question in that way. We're also on the program today going to be talking about drones. Like are they, you know, great fun for some people, but really annoying for other people. People. Uh, and uh, somebody got in touch with us to say that half ten at night was one of them flying over the garden and wondering what the legalities of it is. So we're going to be talking about that as well. And also talking about the kids are going to be starting school or starting school again. And there's a lot of anxiety um, involved in that. But really, who's more anxious? Is it you or your child? And is your anxiety about what your own experience at school if it's you or do you just worry about your child uh, and they're not worried at all and they're picking up on your anxiety we're going to be talking about all of that today so uh, that's more to come as well uh, between now and midday so let's have your say uh, on whatever is exercising your brains this morning 83 975 is how you do it or you can call 051 846 and somebody that did just that yesterday uh, I'm not going to say who their name is but they did contact the programme yesterday which started a bit of a ball rolling for us because so many of you got in touch and it kind of has spread into other areas as well and this is the subject of how many tablets how many days in a month when it comes to uh, getting a tablet because this uh, man uh, said contacted me to say can a pharmacy refuse to give you 30 or 31 tablets each month they give me 28 each month which leaves me short so my two my two by six month uh, prescription doesn't last a year and I have to go to the doctor three times a year instead of two costing me 70 euro extra extra per year. They get paid for each prescription, so three payments instead of two per, per person per year adds up to a tidy sum. And that opened uh, quite the floodgate and loads of you got in touch this morning uh, saying they have the same issue. Uh, somebody else said I went on medication nine years ago. Every box of tablets had 30 in it. Then all of a sudden it was only 28. I agree, it's mad as only one month had 28 days and the rest of either 30 or 31. Um, somebody else getting a monthly script it clearly says 30 days but it's always 20 28 tablets, something is not right. And it also, as I said, extended to mobile phone packages. And, you know, apparently in the world of business, a month is 28 days. Who knew? Isn't, isn't that a bit smart uh, to have? Uh, t- I want to discuss this with Dermot Jewell, who's policy advisor with the Consumer Association of Ireland. You're very welcome to the programme, Dermot. Thanks, Maria. Good or, morning to or you. Back to the programme, I should say. Now, no, I... I kind of, I was quite surprised about this. And when I thought about it, they're going, yeah, all of a sudden, is, is 28 days the norm in terms of counting a month in the world of business? Or are they just kind of scamming us? Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, I won't jump to the, to immediately suggest it's a scam, but I'll, I'll try to explain best how, um, having looked at this a little more deeply, um, and I'll, I'll actually caution as well, uh, really need to look into this more deeply because it, it, it's close to a scam. Um, but it's uh, well. Let's let's, let's be more kind. Let's say maximising their profits. <laughs> they are. They are. <laughs> Let me explain. First of all, I mean anybody who watches television, particularly these who are where you're you're, you're looking at where they're looking at homes and they're buying and selling them. But everybody refers to per calendar month. Mm. So the, the 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 year is broken down into a calendar month, twelve calendar months. Um, and that the, would be the, whether for 28, 29, 30, um, or 31 days. So I'll, I'll start first, if I may, with this. Uh, and, and I've heard this said that, and that a lot of telephone companies, apparently, um, which I was not aware of, are suggesting that a, a month is 28 days. Yeah. Now, this comes down to the terms of the, of the contract. Um, it, it, nobody can dictate that a month is, is 28 days. It's not possible to do that. It's, it's set in stone. It's, it's, it's a fluctuating structure. The key, though, is that in a contract, if you have signed for um, 12 months at 28 days, then that is, to all intents and purposes, an 11-month contract. But do we not? Uh, we, but we sign up for a monthly contract. I mean, for a mobile phone, it's like pay, I don't know, 15, 20 euro a month. It doesn't say every 28 days. 
this is exactly it. And if it only specifies a month, then it's whatever the month is that you are signed up for. So if it's if it's the month of December, it's 31 days. If it's the month of February, it's either 28 or 29, depending on the year, and so on. Um, and because it's a month-to-month basis. And that kind of brings us... Um, I, I, I can come back to it now, but that kind of, but I'm sorry, sticking with it. If if somebody was suggesting that I have a contract that is te- that the telephone company are telling me it's 28 days a month, um, then there's a problem and they need to look at the contract because, as I say, 28 days uh, over across a year equates to 336 days. That is 29 days short of a year. So mm. it's not an annual contract. It's 11 months. Um, and it needs to be investigated. And I'd love to hear from anybody who has that particular problem because that has to be remedied. That is wrong as far as I would be concerned. So and just to really clarify there, Dermot, sorry, just to clarify, if somebody yeah. is, is safe, your mobile phone, say, if it's a monthly thing yeah. and it's only 28 days, do you want to hear from those people or do you want to hear from the people who are, it's, it's oh. like a, a bill pay for want of a better word? I'd like to hear from people who are on a bill pay that's a rolling over because if it's if if they've agreed to only a contract for 28 days, okay, then that's different as opposed to a monthly contract. If if you understand, it's yeah, down to interpretation. So that they signed up for days, or does it say a month? That's the key part in all of this. Okay, so you want to hear from from those people, um, please. Now the pharmacy issue. A lot of people would think, look, at the end of the day, you know, 28th, two days doesn't really make any difference. I can't be bothered. But the pharmacy thing, you can't get those tablets without a doctor. So you have to trot back to the surgery, fork out your 50, 60, 70 quid, whatever it is, to get something that if you surely present to the pharmacy, here is my prescription. I'm coming in for the month of June, whatever it is. You should get the amount of tablets that that month that you've come in for, surely. That, that's just common sense, is it not? It, it is. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and there are two things underpinning and underlying what's going on. One, it, it, it has become a, a, a norm um, whereby if you're... Let, let's take, And I'm going to actually state, let, let's say you're, you're, you're on a particular tablet. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's one that half the population apparently, unfortunately, are on, Lipitor. If, if you get a prescription that says on that prescription, for, you're on that, that medicine um, at, at 10 mils for 28 days by six months, that's specific. If it says you're on that tablet for 10 mils for 30 days by six months, that's specific. That's what's written down. And a pharmacist must supply what it says on that prescription. The problem that's arising, and particularly where it's a rolling over one, it's a six-monthly one, it will generally say that the, the, the product at 10 mils again by six over 12. And that means it's, it's, it, it's a monthly supply repeating by six months. And as I have learned, um, that apparently leaves it open to interpretation by the pharmacist that a monthly supply is a blister pack of 28. And that's, I think, that interpretation is is very one-sided. It suits the pharmacy. Mm. It does not suit the patient. Um, it doesn't suit the consumer. I think it's really, really wrong. Um, and unfortunately, um, I think a lot of us are going to have to go back to our pharmacists and say, I know you have an interpretation of my um, prescription which suggests that it's 28 days in a month. It's not. I want precisely the amount of tablets in each month that that six month is covering. And if we have an argument over it, then give me back the prescription and I'm going to take it to somebody who cares. So you, you have rights here. You can much. insist that, uh, you know, a you month is however many days is in the actual bloody month. That's exactly it, because this is the interpretation of, of a seller and you're the person paying for a prescription but you've been given by a doctor who would unknowingly potentially um, has not re- realised that oh dear lord they're going to just supply a 28 day blister mm. pack um, and, and, and not give the other two or three because they don't want to break a pack 
Oh, I hear. Um, and you can see what's happening here, mm. and it's it's wrong. Uh, it's it's it is different. I've, I've again, I've learned. I, I must say uh, thanks to the pharmaceutical societies because I asked them about um, medicine prescriptions, etc. And um, it's on controlled drugs that, for example, it's a doctor must be very specific, uh, both in words and figures. So they have to specify the number, and they must write the number, whether it's two or three or five or six. And and that's fair enough. But again, they were explaining to me that a lot of this manufacturing packaging has come about um, predominantly through a, 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 an NHS, a National Health Service preference in the UK, where it facilitates hospital management and a variety of other things. And it kind of got l- locked mm. in um, and picked up by the world and its mother, which does not suit the patient. Um, and it doesn't help a patient who's trying to manage, um, OK, how many tablets have I to take in this month? And if they suddenly come to 27 and go, how many have I taken 27 or what? And yeah. there's still four days left in the month. It's not funny. So it does need to be remedied. Um, no, pardon, pardon the word, the usage there. But I think it's poor form the way it's being interpreted um, at the pharmacy counter level. So anyone who's a victim of this can get in touch with the Consumer Association of Ireland and, and let you know. So hopefully we can maybe yeah, bring about a change. Would, just uh, the email us if they call that the C- T-H-E-C-A-I dot I-E um, uh, the C-A-I dot I-E because I, 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 I've no, I know this has been going on for years but it, it kept peaking and dropping off and it's. I think it's time mm. it was properly addressed and literally properly addressed to the the society that represents pharmacists and a variety of others to get to get this situation put in perspective. Is it a calendar month or is it a contracted month or what exactly is going to be the interpretation of a month? Because certainly from, from, from our interpretation that we've picked up from your good self and your listeners, um, we're the people who are losing money. And just for, for absolute clarification, Dermot, before I let you go, can I, sure. can I be, if I'm in the pharmacy and, you know, can I say there's 31 days in this month, make sure you give me 31 tablets. Can they go, well, no, I'm not, because they only come in 28 packets. Can I stand my ground and go, well, give me back my prescription then, or what's the deal? You, you, you can stand your ground because you have a prescription that says you're to be, give, you're to be given tablets yeah. covering a six-month period. So I d- yeah, everyone should just stand their ground over it and just go, no, yeah. I want the amount of days and, and make sure you give them to me. Yeah, I know it's not going to be easy. But then again, pharmacists, in fairness to them, they're, they, they work with the community, they understand the community. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping there won't be a, much of a pushback at all. OK. Dermot, thanks as always for talking to me. A pleasure. And for all the information. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. That's uh, Dermot Jewell there, policy advisor with the Consumer Association of Ireland. Uh, That's who you've been listening to. It's quite interesting, that uh, whole thing. So there you are. You're going in the pharmacy. Just go, no, no, thanks. We're in this month. There's 31 days. And... uh, I want to make sure you give me 31 tablets and check before you leave and stand. We have to start getting a bit bulgy, I think, and not just going out and complaining to each other about everything. Uh, just go on and, you know, have them dread the sight of you coming into the pharmacy. Oh, God, here's this old boy coming in. <laughs> give her a trap. Let's get rid of her. Now, um, if you, it will be a great source of relief, I think, to uh, many people who had applied for the um, retrofit grant scheme. Do you remember last week we were talking about the fact that uh, the plug had been pulled on it and a lot of people had spent a considerable amount of money preparing from it for it. I think initially a lot of people thought that some Egypts had gone ahead and done the work, you know, and everybody was going to be sure they shouldn't have done it. They didn't have the money in their hand. They had no right to do that. But that wasn't the case. Apparently to prepare for this, there's a lot of investment. Some people like have spent maybe two and a half grand to prepare for this work that you have to get consultants in and all that kind of stuff. So there was an outlay for people who then all of a sudden were told that um, that money is gone and you're not getting it. But a bit of a U-turn. Caroline O'Doherty is environment correspondent with the Irish Independent and and is on the line now. Caroline, you're very welcome back to the programme. Thanks for joining me. Um, good morning. A good news and a bit of relief, I'd say, for a lot of people. There is. It hasn't 
quietly um, quite uh, you know uh, cured all the annoyance at what happened over the past week though um, yeah anybody who had their application in in time but it hadn't been assessed evaluated and the decision hadn't been made on it um, at, the, at the time the decision was made to just scrap the whole scheme they will now have their application considered in full um, and the reality is most of them will be approved because as you pointed out a lot of preparatory work goes into making the application in the first place it has to um, so they're pretty much assured that their application will be assessed. It will be assessed, pretty much assured it will be approved and money will be on the way to them, uh, possibly possibly a little later than would have been expected under the normal system. Um, we're still looking for a bit of clarity on that, but the Minister did say that yesterday that most of the money would probably be drawn down next year. Some people would have been probably expecting to get it, uh, you know, in, in sort of October, November, December and, and start work then. So we'll have to wait and see whether there's going to be a delay in that because the issue is, or seems to be, just where is the money coming from on this? There was a certain budget for this um, and the sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, which administered the scheme, uh, had, had sought extra money for it because there was an unanticipated high number of applicants. Although that's how you could, how it could be unanticipated because we know for a fact um, the state of the building stock, the housing stock in Ireland. We know there are an awful lot of houses in very poor condition. They were built without uh, insulation. They were built with the oldest and most inefficient heating systems. So we know all that. Um, but regardless of that, there was a budget set. Um, more applicants, uh, applicants came in late in the day than was anticipated or was provided for. Uh, so the whole thing is going to cost more money than, than anticipated. So we're still waiting to see when exactly that money is going to be released to the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland to actually honour these grants. You'd wonder what they were thinking of, though. Like, do they not know that people would have to do this preparatory work? Was that not part of the application form? And would they not know that people would be out of pocket? Or are they all getting paid so much that two and a half grand is like, ah, should throw only down about 20 quid in my terms? I, it's, you it's, know, it's very hard to know. The minister said yesterday he wasn't happy. He, he understood why the decision had been made, but he wasn't happy with the way the decision had been reached. But in making that decision, it had to be known to all mm. that, yes, you cannot just throw in an application. First of all, you can't do it as an individual. You have to go through this intermediary. You have to go through one of the energy efficiency companies. Um, and they put in a, a sort of a, a group bulk um, application. They get a number of householders ready to go at the same time because there's certain efficiencies in, even in, in that, if you're, if you're putting in insulation or heat pumps or whatever, to get a cluster of, of homes together. So you can't do it as an individual. You have to go, go to a, um, an expert. They need certain information put in place, um, gathered to see what, your house, what, what kind of new heating systems and, and energy efficiency systems your house is suitable for. That all costs money. And even if you, at, at, the, at the basics, they're saying you will spend, you will spend two grand to two and a half thousand euro just getting to that stage. Many other people whose houses are particularly old who will be going for the highest available grant, um, they have to do structural work on their homes before they can even mm. allow uh, uh, prepare, to prepare their homes for the works that are that are supported by the grants, so you know you can't you can't sort of apply for a new uh, heat pump system if, for example, your floorboards are falling apart. But the the, the, the grant doesn't cover the floorboards. It's a different system. So you're going to have to go and get all that fixed. Maybe maybe change walls, all that kind of thing. So people would have invested. Some people would have invested maybe tens of thousands to get to the stage where they could put in the grant to continue the work, and they were really were left in the lurch by the decision last week. It's amazing where they can find the money when they it's looking like it's going to be bad PR for them, isn't it? Uh, Caroline, thank you very much for talking to me. You're welcome. See you, bye-bye. That's uh, Caroline O'Doherty there, Environment Correspondent with the Irish Independent. 83 975 for your texts. 0518461234 for your phone calls. When we come back after the break, we should be talking about um, millennials having to pay this new broadcast tax, you know, this broadcast tax, I'm going to call it a tax, let's call it spade a spade, uh, that's going to be coming in um, and asking, you know, is it okay for everybody who doesn't watch television 
decision to pay this charge so that uh, older generations can still watch RTE programmes. What do you think about that? Let me know back after these. Dacia Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. You are welcome back to the programme. It's Maria in for Damien. I'm not ignoring your comments, so just bear with me. I uh, just went, went into full flight there with the whole uh, 28, 31 day thing with Dermot Jewel, so I'm running a bit behind, uh, but I will be coming to them, so just be a little bit patient with me if you don't mind. And I do appreciate you sending in uh, your texts, of course. But uh, what we're talking about next is drones, because I had this, um, I was contacted in my own programme on Saturday. Uh, by somebody. We were talking about neighbours uh, on the show, not the TV show, but actual neighbours who live next door to you. And a man called in to say that last night, which would have been Friday night, at half ten, there was drones flying around his house. Is this legal or when is it disturbing someone's privacy? So we thought uh, we'd try and get a bit of information on that. And we have Jerry Byrne, who's a leading Irish aviation expert and commentator uh, with some insights into the rules and regulations covering this uh, from a privacy point of view. Jerry, you're very welcome to the programme. Thank you so much for coming on. Glad to be here, Maria. Now, um, I, I can imagine it must be quite weird if you're out in your garden, maybe, and some this j- drone is flying, even innocently, overhead. But it feels a little bit intrusive. Is it actually illegal? In certain circumstances, yes, it is. Um, although th- there is a, a kind of a pitfall in the legislation and the regulations in that they only appear to apply to drones one kilogram in weight or more. And that's is a fairly hefty thing. It's not the kind of thing that your your average schoolboy or schoolgirl gets as a birthday present. Um, they tend to be much smaller little things. Um, but uh, there are regulations nonetheless, um, and you you are not allowed to operate one within a certain distance of a building, for example. And it, if, you, if you fly within 30 metres of any person, person, vessel or structure, you could be in breach of the regulations. And 30 metres is, what, roughly 100 feet. And I remember the last time that that I spoke about this, somebody said that there was a drone over her head when she was putting her shopping in the supermarket in the boot of her car, which seems really weird. Like, who who do you go to if you think, I don't like this anywhere near me, I don't want it over my house? Who can you complain to? And how would you even identify the drone? Well, this is the problem, isn't it? As, mm. as Gatwick Air- Airport discovered last year when drones were flying around the place uh, and affecting flights, and they couldn't identify the drone. The person to, or the people to complain to uh, is the Irish Aviation Authority, um, based in Dublin, which licenses drones and produces the regulations to, to control them. Um, but your big problem, of course, is going to be you, you can't identify the operator of the drone. Uh, very easily. Now, you may see a, a man standing nearby with a little um, thing with an aerial on it and a joystick, um, and he very often will be the owner or the operator of mm. the drone. The, there is another regulation, incidentally, uh, that unless you get special permission, which, which takes a bit of getting, you can't operate your drone more than 300 metres away from yourself. So again, that's 100 feet. So it always has to be more or less within line of sight. Um, so if you see a drone flying overhead and you can't see anybody that appears to be the operator with a little joystick thing in their hand, um, well, then you can be pretty sure that that drone, unless it has special permission to operate in that way, uh, you can assume that it is operating illegally. If you get a lot of complaints, um, incidentally, about drones, or if, if people band together, say the entire city of Waterford decides they've had enough drones for one day, and they complain en masse to the Irish Aviation Authority, it is quite likely that the Irish Aviation Authority would then ban drones over Waterford. And that's, that's another possibility. But at the same time, um, generally speaking, you can't use them if there, is, um, you know, if there are a lot of buildings and properties and people. I mean, for example, you're not allowed to operate them over an assembly of 12 people or more. So if you've got 12 people, you know, standing on the main street in Waterford, um, you shouldn't have a drone operating over the main street in Waterford. It's it, 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 it yeah. quite simple. And also built up areas, by and large, and within, as I say, 100 feet of any person, vessel or structure. Uh, so if it's operating within 100 feet from your house, you have a, 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 a cause for complaint. If, of course, 
you can identify the owner and the operator. <laughs> it's all, if you pardon the pun, it's all a bit up in the air, like in terms of what you can do once you see the bloody thing and you don't see anyone uh, near it. Just before I let you go, Jerry, can I just ask you about the Ryanair situation? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people concerned. Uh, I know that the court case was adjourned yesterday, if I'm correct in saying. Uh, the court case was adjourned and it's uh, on again today. Now, I've had no um, knowledge of what, what what has been said in court this morning, but I understand that the pilots, the, the union side, as it were, is now having its say. Uh, most of yesterday was devoted to the, um, the, 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 the submission by Ryanair itself, which alleged that, the, comp- that the, the union was operating outside of an agreement it had made with Ryanair to go to arbitration if they couldn't agree on anything. Um, now, they were actually in arbitration when uh, the union declared that it had had enough of this and was now calling strike notice um, and that it had been in arbitration for something like four months they are in negotiations for something like four months. The um, airline is, is uh, saying that, you know, the, the, the union has breached these rules. The union is saying, no, those rules, that agreement only applied to an earlier set of agreement of uh, negotiation. Um, and and it, it's continuing that line of country this morning um, in, the, in the High Court. OK, it's a worrying time for people going on holidays, though. You know, we were making that point when we were talking about it last week, that you've saved all your money. You know, you can't just decide to defer your holiday, really, when your kids are excited because they're going. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit mean. It is, it is um, a very disturbing, but at the same time, I suppose, why go on strike when it's not going to affect Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> um, you know, you've got, you, if you want to make an impact on your employer, um, you, 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 do it where, you do it where it will hurt, as it were. Um, the, the, the bright side of things is that there is a possibility that um, the, the court might Find in Ryanair's favour mm. and uh, cause the strike to the strike to be deferred, or um, well, the, the ultimate thing is, of course, it won't affect every flight. Um, the, there's only something like thirty percent of Ryanair pilots on strike. The rest of them can't go on strike because they're not directly employed by Ryanair. They're employed under a, a relatively novel agreement that Ryanair has with with new pilots, in that it. it, it requires them to form a limited company with two, two other uh, pilots and then to sell the services of that limited company to an employment agency, mm. which in turn sells their services to Ryanair. So they're not on the books. They're regarded as independent contractors and they can't go on strike or they can't even uh, get involved in um, collective bargaining like uh, the average trade union because that would be in breach of competition law. So it's not labour law that prevents them from going on strike, it's competition law, which is rather interesting. Um, So they're not involved, they will be flying, um, and you can be sure that Ryanair will do everything (laughs) they can to get get as many planes as it can in the air, which might include bringing in off-duty pilots from other European places. We don't know. Mm. Um, They claim that the last time this happened, they were able to uh, get something like 93% of their passengers away, um, and that involved very often putting them on other airlines, like, you know, Aer Lingus or British Airways or whatever. Now, this is all complicated by the fact that British uh, pilots working for Ryanair, a a number of them are also going to be on strike on Friday. Be interesting to see what happens today. Jerry Byrne, thanks a million for talking to me. Really do appreciate your time. You're very welcome, Maria. Thanks very much. That's uh, Jerry Byrne there, who's a leading Irish aviation expert, and he uh, gave us some insight there on drones and also on Ryanair. I'll be back after these. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremore. You are welcome back to the programme. Can I let you know about a 10k walk that's taking place. It's from uh, Port Law to Curramore and it's happening on Sunday at 2 o'clock. It's starting at the Forge Inn in Port Law and it's going to Kelly's Gates in Curramore and back and it's for a very good cause. It's all to raise money for the Irish Kidney Association. That's the Waterford branch of the Irish Kidney Association. So if you fancy that, go out for a nice walk for yourself and uh, make raising some uh, much needed funds and funds that are put to very good use um, then you could go along to that on Sunday. 
right now. The HPV vaccine for boys will be rolled out next month with parents being urged to protect their sons from cancer but research highlights that 75% don't understand what the virus is. To talk us through that I have Dr Philip Kiernan who's a Cork City based GP. You're very welcome to the programme Dr Kiernan. Thanks very much Maria and thanks for having me on. No problem. Um, I would have thought after all the the talk when it was being introduced for the girls that everybody knows what the HPV um, vaccine is for and what the human papilloma virus is, but apparently not. No, you would would have hoped that that message had gotten across, but what this recent research is showing is that up to 80% of the population or 75% of the population don't understand just how common the HPV virus is. I mean, this is a virus that 80% of people who are sexually active have had at some stage in their life, and yet the research suggests that only 20% of people think that there's any possibility that they've ever had it. So that's a pretty big Mm. disconnect between, uh, between the understanding, the reality, and what people actually understand about it. Now, is there a a mix-up maybe between a cold sore and this, or are they two different things? So they are two different things, what you're you're talking about, and they they both sound similar. Cold sores are caused by herpes simplex virus, which is HSV, and this is the human papilloma virus, which is HPV. This is the problem with all of us medics giving things (laughs) three-letter abbreviations. They sound very similar, even when they're not. No, this is um, this is a virus that causes. It's very similar actually to the virus that causes the the common warts that you'd see on people's hands, and in fact, a lot of strains of it do cause genital warts. Um, but more seriously than genital warts, although they are incredibly uh, uncomfortable and upsetting to people who have them, is it's it is the cause of cervical cancer, which I think we've the, that message has gotten out that this is a cervical cancer vaccine that we're talking about. But also it's associated with penile and anal cancers as well, um, which hasn't been talked about before. So there is good reason to treat boys aside from just reducing the risk of exposing um, women to HPV by not treating the carriers of it. Do you think there'll be sort of, the, there was a certain amount of resistance uh, to some people, from some people, I should say, when it was rolled out for, for girls. Do you think there'll be anything like that this time around, or has everybody caught on now? That, that I would love to think that there's not. And reassuringly, we're seeing an upswing in the uptake of uh, the HPV vaccine among girls over the last two years. So hopefully, the, the the nonsense that led to the deteriorating numbers of people going for the vaccine has hopefully that that tide has turned and um, i would be i think i think it's a bit naive to think that we won't meet some resistance to people when this vaccine is rolled out to boys but hopefully it will be small and we'll see really really good uptake of it uh, in september and uh, if you had i know you you you're a father of two boys but you said mm. you would have paid to have them vaccinated if they were of if, absolutely you know. yeah yeah, I, it, it's a vaccine that I feel very strongly about, which is why I'm trying to, to get the message out there that people do need to get vaccinated. I mean, we, we talk uh, we talk about trying to find a cure for cancer and fighting cancer. Now we have a vaccine that can potentially um, significantly reduce, if not eliminate, certain types of cancer. Um, it's there. It's ready for use, you know. Uh, I think this is, is a, a huge opportunity to safeguard our children's future. Um, and I think we should be grasping it with both hands. It's yeah, it's kind of hard hard to understand because I think before this vaccine came into being, if anyone had said we have a vaccine that will prevent cancer, we'd all been queuing up yeah. outside the door. And as soon as we have I a remember, vaccine, yeah. like people are going, oh no, I'm not giving my child that. It does this, that, and the other. And I heard it does exactly. this, and I read it does that. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those things that like people, anything new that you're actively doing um, for your child, it's something that. It puts the responsibility on the parent to make the decision to do it. Um, and it can feel intuitively that not doing anything is a safer course of action. But of course, what you're doing is you're, you're leaving them, you're increasing their risk of exposure to dangerous things later in life. Mm. Um, so I, it, it, the misinformation that was put out there uh, uh, over previous years, I think, was very, very damaging and terrifying to parents because trying to wade through mountains of very dry scientific statistical writing is difficult to form your own opinion on it. Mm. And then everyone is using your own fear and all parents want to do is what's best for their children. And they're using that to further their own aims and to undermine your faith in uh, trusted experts. Um, And that's the difficulty with it, you know. 
And uh, this this vaccine is going to be for all first year boys at second level schools. First year boys in second level schools starting from September. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for talking to me, Dr. Kiernan. Okay. See you. Bye bye. That's uh, Dr. Philip Kiernan. There's a Cork City based GP. Um, if you have boys of that age, are you going to um, give consent for them to have the vaccine? You can let me know anonymously if you like on 083 975 or you can call 051 846 123. Back after these. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road. And in Tremor. Now, just before we head towards news, a lot of reaction coming in about the um, the broadcast charge, this proposed law, a broadcast charge. I was talking to a columnist who said uh, basically that you'd be paying this broadcast charge so that older people could watch RTE because pretty much they're the only people who watch TV in that way and certainly going forward uh, will be the only people who will continue to watch TV in that way whereas everybody else um, will have their Netflix and their you know their smartphones they just have so many different ways of uh, watching TV and somebody says Maria let's have the older people please I'm 60 I don't use RTE I use free sat and Netflix if people want to watch RTE then make it subscription only as it is in uh, Sky or Virgin then those who want to watch it can pay for it uh, D4 is on 384,000 per annum, uh, says the texture. Uh, two RTE orchestras are costing 250 grand a year, and that's without even going into the ridiculous salaries. Uh, RTE is a relic; it's over. And I suppose the reason, the, the 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 strange thing there is that they will say they need to pay their presenters huge amounts of money to attract the advertising revenue. But if you did, if you like, if you didn't need the advertising revenue because you were making do with the money that you get from the broad the license fee that you've been getting up to now, it's the kind of the argument kind of contradicts their own argument. If you see the point that I'm rather clumsily trying to make as I head towards the news, I'll try and make it a bit clearer when we come back after the news at eleven o'clock. So here it is with Sinead. Data today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to MulliganSpharmacy.com, life's a Beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. You are welcome into the second hour of the show. It's Maria in for Damien. Thank you very much for your company and we're getting through a lot this morning. Now some of your comments uh, that we have coming in about RTE. RTE is a commercial station. The ads should pay for it. That's the way it works in the UK. You only pay for BBC, says Jimmy. Nothing on all summer, only repeat, says somebody else. Uh, Paul is in Tremor. She says, morning Maria, not happy at all. Having to pay as RTE broadcast repeats all summer that we've watched two or three times or more. Disgraceful waste of money for a licence. Uh, I gave up watching RTE during the summer. Too many repeats. That's, that seems to be the general bugbear that a lot of people have is that they just show too many repeats and it's not worth the fee. Uh, on the other hand though, Owen says, Maria, what about all the live sports coverage that RTE do on programmes like the local GIY show where other channels might not want to cover it? If that all goes to Sky or God forbid Netflix, we could end up paying a lot more than the current licence uh, as against the renamed charge. The split of the licence and current RTE value for money are also part of the debate. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, then, then nobody's suggesting throwing the baby out with the bathwater, in fairness, um, Owen. But if, if it's a case that RTE do good programmes, I don't think anybody would doubt that. And like GIY is a fantastic programme, uh, as we know, and the primetime programme, they're all great programmes. But they spend an awful lot of money on absolute crap as well. So like, they have to call that into question. You can't have access to, you can't pay your stars a fortune, have access for ad revenue, have uh, all, have everything basically coming in the door. And then maybe people, I don't care what you have on, I don't want to watch RTE. Why am I being made pay to watch RTE? Um, and just have it as a, you know, do you want to subscribe to RTE? There, pay your money, sort it. Um, but uh, listen to this poor person talking about TV licence. My mother had gotten the free TV licence when she turned 70. She died on Sunday, the 16th of October, 2011. On, sa- on the 27th of October, a demand notice arrived to the house to say that because there was no licence linked to the house, a fine would be enforced. We were in the middle of changing the name on all the different utilities, but I found it very harsh to have a demand in such a manner. I wouldn't blame you. That was uh, very, very harsh and uh, not very pleasant for you at the time. I'm sure you had enough going on. Um, but keep your thoughts coming in. 83 975 If or OK, here's a question for you. If RTE on its own 
was a subscription TV channel, would you pay for it? Let me know. 083 Now, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, involved in being a parent, particularly when it comes to school and you're looking at them there and they're small and they're, you know, no matter what's, what, how old they are, they're still your child. They may be going off to start in school and their uniform is too big for them and they look so vulnerable and... If they're older, then they're going into maybe a school year with an exam. And it's quite a worrying time for, for students and for parents. Uh, and I have on the line somebody to talk about that too now because uh, she is Dr. Mally Coyne, who's a clinical psychologist and lecturer. And she's going to be publishing her first book on children's anxiety with uh, in Ireland next um, April. Um, anxiety and the stresses of upcoming back to school. Uh, That's what we're going to be talking about. You're very welcome uh, to the programme, Dr. Coyne. Good morning, Maria. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how much of the anxiety, you can look at your child, as I said in the in the uh, the intro there, that you can look at your child and they maybe they're small and they're going into school, maybe going into big school, maybe going from primary school into secondary school and you're worried for them and you're worried they're going to be able for it and they'll be popular and will people pick on them? And then other people are looking at their child going, when I was their age, they see themselves in the child that they're now looking at. When I was going into school at that age, I was picked on. I wasn't popular. And that, that gives them anxiety as well. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I suppose. Like I wrote an article yesterday that came out in the Irish Independent and it was all about the idea of, is this worry about me or is it about my child? So when I see um, parents coming into the clinic with uh, children that they say are anxious or my child is anxious, I always tend to look to the parent and just ask them, does your child remind you of anybody that you know? Or I'm just wondering in this situation, is this worry? And, and of course, there are many children out there who are anxious and they are anxious about their own, you know, something that has happened to them. And mm. um, but, it's, but I suppose the lens that parents look through will always be um, through their own experience. And so sometimes your child's return to school may bring back memories of your own child and school experiences, which parents may not be aware of at all. Yeah, that's interesting that it kind of it kind of triggers something in you that yeah. you, you kind of maybe suppressed or you'd forgotten or something. And well, exactly. I mean, you might have parents, like I, I do see a lot of, um, you know, parents wanting to subscribe their kids into loads of activities. And I think that's just the way our lives are now. It's all busy, busy, busy. You know, thinking, oh, well, if they don't do this, then they're going to miss out. If they don't do that, then they're going to miss out Then if they don't do that. But where is that coming from? That kind of that worry is coming from maybe feeling like they missed out on certain things as kids and that's why they're trying to overcompensate by getting their kids involved in everything when in fact their kids don't need to be involved in everything that that's something more to do with how the parent feels themselves and I and I find that happens an awful lot in the work that I do. How are you honest with yourself as a parent about that though how do you take a step back and go hold on a second now What's prompting yeah. this? I think if you react in what I like, what I find is if you react in kind of um, if, you, if your child is a little bit anxious about something and you feel something in your gut, it's almost like in your stomach. Sometimes I, I would feel it more in my stomach or I'd feel it in my body where, you know, you kind of feel like, oh, my God, I don't know how to, you know, you, you get this blankness inside and you don't know how to kind of respond in that moment. And it's a really difficult situation to manage. Sometimes that can kind of show you that there's something going on here where you might have had this need when you were younger and it may not have been met by your parents when you were younger, by one or, you know, either of your parents, or they may not have known how to react to you, which has been now transmitted to you without having any conscious awareness of it. And I suppose what I then say is, I kind of talk about recognizing the discomfort. So if your child throws you an anxiety curveball, as I wrote, or your own back-to-school worries are creeping up, you recognize the discomfort. You know, this feels bad. Is this about me or is it about my child? You honor it. Um, I am hurting because an old wound may have been triggered or something like that. And then it's only after that that you respond to your child's need where you make a conscious effort to remain calm and pause. So what happens is, you know, if a child is coming to you anxious, then very often the parent reacts in a very kind of anxious, heightened way. 
and that only makes things worse because the child will think, well, actually, you know, there is an actual threat because my ch- my parent is freaking out. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? because I mean, well, particularly when you're small, the parent is their only point of reference. Like they, exactly. everything comes from them. Exactly. So the, your parent is your completely your point of reference, your point of you know letting you know how to interpret your world and how safe the world is. So what I kind of say is. If a child senses their parent becoming anxious, and very often it's not even just the words that the parents are saying, it might be their actions, their reactions, it might even be how they ask a question like, um, how do you feel about going back to school next week? You know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not done in a kind of nonchalant, flippant kind mm. of way. It's like, it, there's so much laden kind of emotion to this question, um, then it could magnify the child's feelings. And if the parent becomes overly worried about their child's anxiety and over-engages with the worries to the point that they can take on the worries themselves, then they, they can cause the child to believe there's a threat and that their anxiety is warranted. So they might say, mom or dad looks full of worry. They don't believe I can do this and neither do I. But on the other hand, you've got parents that might dismiss the child's worry. Like I've had parents come to me and say, I've been told by even by a therapist, which I was quite surprised at, but I've been told not to discuss anxiety with my child because it'll make them more worried. And it, that's, that's not, that's completely the other end of the spectrum, where if you tell your child to get over it and grow a thick skin, they might end up feeling bad about being anxious or that there's something wrong with them and they can't trust their feelings because their body is telling them that they feel anxious. It's a very physical feeling. So glossing over it, hoping it goes away, will not make it go away either. It's about kind of trying to unpackage what that anxiety is about and going, okay, you feel worried about this particular about school next week. Can we just take a step back and try to figure out what aspect of school are you are you worried about and just kind of try to reason it out. And uh, you know the way they th- some people give the advice that you have these, I think it's particularly with boys, but I stand to be corrected uh, and please do correct me, uh, Mally, yeah. if that's the case, but that you kind of have these conversations in the car or, you know, you don't sit down and, and focus on them and go, well, tell me now, how are you getting on yeah. in school? Because they, they, they'll just kind of that would that in itself would nearly make them anxious go, oh God, Mal wants to know what I was doing in school today. What am I going to do? Whereas if you just kind of nonchalantly have the conversation with your ears pricked, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, no, that's totally true, particularly for kids like over 10. Um, they say that teenagers have difficulties um, recognizing facial emotions because there's so much brain development going on that they can't actually read faces as well as a, as a grown up or as a younger child would. So they, that's why it's better to do it side by side when a child is over 10 or over 12, that kind of thing, and trying to be nonchalant and ask a specific question rather than how are you feeling about it or something like, you know, you could ask something a little bit more specific than that, but try to be as, as casual about it as possible. And I, I wrote in the article, if you're, wor- if you're wondering how your child feels about starting back at school, you can just ask them. You know, mm. it's not like a crime to just say it to them and you know in a you know carefree way and they might be they might have had difficulties before school ended but that but by no means does that mean they're going to have difficulties this year you know yeah and i suppose it, be it, better. it sorry to cut across you i suppose yeah. it's really important that your child knows you as somebody who will listen yeah as opposed to just kind of brushing off their their anxieties or going, oh, sure, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, this, that and the other, that they, even if you say nothing, that you've heard them. Absolutely. I mean, I think we all, every single human being on this planet, one of our biggest needs is to feel validated. And if a child worries, shares a worry with you, listen to their feelings, validate their experience, exactly what you're saying there, Mm -hmm. Maria. Like you feel a bit nervous about seeing those kids again respond warmly, empathetically, unpackage the source of their worry, like what part are you most worried about? Try not to smooth things over in a bid to make them and you feel better. But just really like, oh, that sounds really tough for you. I wa-. And then once you kind of 
meet them in that validation, that listening validation. It's the same for adults talking to each other or any, any human talking to any human. It's only when you feel truly validated that you can kind of move on to going, okay, let's try to figure out a way of making this better for you. So you're worried about, um, you know, maybe not having the nicest clothes or, or these kids over there or something like that. Mm. I wonder what we could do. Maybe we'll, you know, uh, enroll, like, I don't know, build up a friendship with somebody here in that school like I always encourage parents to build up alliances in the, with school as well but and then even exploring thoughts so sometimes think kids can be and so can adults but really black and white like it's going to be terrible okay can we think about this in a different way uh, remember last year when you were really worried about such and such and then you went in and it worked out yeah. okay so that kind of shows that it wasn't. It's not always bad, and at the moment, because you're feeling bad, everything you've got negative. You've got kind of negative spectacles on. You know, and I, I feel sorry for them, uh, for for kids growing up now, because <clears throat> excuse me, they have access to so much, and I don't think they really have. The, the mental capacity or whatever the expression is, the brain to be able to filter it. And for example, all the things about the environment and, you know, we have 11 years to save the world. Like if I was four and I heard that, I'd be terrified. I know, absolutely. No, there's a lot of, I think there's an, a bombardment of kind of information out there about, you know, which, which, is, which is going to be be very worrying to them, you know, and this whole, oh, well, if you don't do a good junior sort of good exams now, you're never going to get a good job. And all this kind of stuff is just absolute rubbish. It's not true. There's many ways of getting to where you want to get as you get older. And it's very difficult to know as a young child what it is you want to do. But I would say to parents to, I suppose, you know, within reason, limit children's kind of exposure to all the negativity that's out there. Yeah, because they're kind of included in everything these days. I think. I mean, yeah. I, I would have been protected a certain amount and anybody um, of my generation would have been protected a certain amount, maybe too much in some instances in terms of death and things. You know, you wouldn't be, yeah. let's see anyone, you wouldn't be brought to funerals or anything like that. But now it's like, uh, they're included in everything and an awful lot of it is just a source of anxiety to them. And I think that's why people like yourself have to write books about anxious children, which is sad. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I mean, it's definitely, um, I kind of call it the perfect storm where we have, you know, we all have this negativity bias in our brains, which, in other words, we tune to negative information more readily than we do to positive information. And that's a very kind of survival mm. instinct that all humans have. But if you have that combined with the world that we live in that feels kind of full of threat in a way, like this bombardment of information is threat, you know, of, of, of finding out these things that are going on around the world and, you know, it's doom and gloom. And, and even just when, when kids have downtime, they're, they're in front of a screen. And that's, yeah. not, that's not what that downtime should be downtime. And that's why I always talk about not over-enrolling kids in loads of activities. Give them a chance to play and imagine things and use their brain and imagine the the fort or imagine the, you know, the being on the ocean or whatever it is and and use their creativity that way. Absolutely. Um, Your book is coming out in April of next year, so I'm sure we'll be speaking to you then. Next April with HarperCollins. Lovely. Okay, Dr. Mally, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you so much. Bye bye. That's uh, Dr. Mally Coyne there, a clinical psychologist and lecturer. And uh, that book, uh, I'd say a lot of people will be interested in it, but it's not due to be published published until April of next year. But uh, as I said, I'm sure either uh, myself on a Saturday or Damien on this programme will speak to uh, Dr. Uh, Coyne when the book is out again. Good morning, Maria, says Thomas. I watch the news and that's all. But I watch the news, the nine o'clock news when Sharon Evian is on. That's the only time. <laughs> but I was asking you if RTE was subscription only, would you pay? Uh, let me have your thoughts on that. 083333975. Coming up after the break, William Smith, vet at City Vets, is here. Um, so you can answer any questions about uh, your pets. So get them in to 083333. 975 or you can uh, call 051 846 123. That's on the way after these. 
Daisha Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. You are welcome back to the programme. I'm joined in studio now by William Smith, who's a vet at City Vets on Matty's Hill in Waterford City because uh, he's our resident vet now. <laughs> he's nice on one nice Thanks very much for coming in. Um, if you have any questions uh, for William, 083 975. That's how you get in touch. You can call 0518461213 and I'm going to come to some of your questions now. But we just want to have a little bit of a chat, first of all, William, about how we relate to our pets. That's what you wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so today. I was having to think about what we might talk about today. And uh, the um, I want to have a think about how pets, uh, we have this thing that pets are like their owners. Is that true or not? And I think my, my theory, and I'd like people's comments on this, my theory is that pets don't reflect us but they reflect who we would like to be they reflect our aspirations and maybe in the same way that some people would buy a, a car that might reflect who, who they want to be seen as uh, I think our, our pets do the same and uh, except because we're in this more intimate relationship with our pets uh, than we are with our cars I think pets reflect our aspirations much more accurately and I'll talk a little bit about that mm-hmm. Do you First, mean uh, now do you mean sorry to cut across you but do you mean that I buy a pet so that other people will look at me and have certain perceptions about me. Is yeah, that what you mean? I think not quite as simple as that. But I think uh, coming into the clinic, we'd see people who have this really, really strong bond with their pets. And I think in those cases, when I think about those people that that that, uh, that I'd have seen over the years that have this really special bond with their pet, with this this really a really special uh, part of their lives, I think in those cases I can see how how um, that pet reflects not the person but the, the, the aspirations of, the, of that person what that person would like to be and I'll, I'll give you some examples of mm-hmm. that uh, can I start off I, I've, I have to make a little apology for uh, I have, I, I've heard since I was here last month that I upset a couple of our listeners okay so uh, so I was here last month and talking about about how to prevent allergies uh, and about how much of Damien was human uh, it turns out it was 43% you missed it 43% of, of Damien, Damien is, is, human. Is, is human yeah but uh, but anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was in Tremor and uh, uh, there's a dog in, that comes into Tremor who, who we'd have to say isn't my number one fan. I think it'd be fair to say. And uh, there are certain things that, about which he and I disagree <laughs> profoundly, like whether it's OK for me to give him injections or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, his owner came in and said, uh, she was sitting having a cup of tea about this time in the morning uh, last month. And uh, next thing, the dog started growling out of the blue. The dog was sitting there started growling, uh, going mad and hackles raised and all the rest. And she couldn't figure out why. She thought somebody was maybe coming up to the house. Couldn't figure out why. Of course, she had WLR on in the background. <laughs> and he was... <laughs> and he recognised he recognised the voice <laughs> of his least favourite person. <laughs> it's so, funny, isn't so, it, how uh, they know they're going to the vet. So, Peppy, if you're listening, <laughs> just cool it. <laughs> now, William, I'm not really in your eyes. William's only there to help you, so <laughs> don't be taking things out on William. But we we are we are quite protective about our animals as well. Like most people, I mean, some people are absolutely horrible, but we are quite protective about them. And yeah, well, we see them as part of our family, yeah. and uh, and uh, and feel pr- protective, and and uh, and sometimes we feel protected by them. One of the big reasons that that. Uh, People have pets is 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 for security, is for a feeling of security. Uh, the um, what started me off on this uh, pets reflecting our aspirations was actually a little staycation that I had. My uh, nephew works in the uh, Viking Museum in York, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, there's this very direct connection between the Viking Museum in Waterford or the Vikings in Waterford and the Vikings in York, because there's the same guy Reginald, who was actually king of both. So Reginald was the king of the Vikings of Waterford. He then changed his name uh, and became a Ragnall, which I think probably sounds much more scary. And if you want to subjugate people properly, you have to have a scary, scary name. And he then became king of the Vikings in York. <laughs> Can I tell you one thing? I've, I've one story about Viking names. The best Viking name ever was a guy called Herman Hardax. Okay, Herman Hardax. Now, you're not going to mess with Her- Herman Hardax. That's a great name. And we know there's a guy called Herman Hardax because there's a place in Orkney, a Neolithic burial tomb in Orkney, and when archaeologists went into it to investigate it, they discovered that somebody had broken in before and left graffiti on the walls. Okay? Mm-hmm. And when they read the graffiti, they realised that actually the people who had broken in was a, a raiding party of Vikings in 1150. 
and they'd spent the night there to get away from the storm and had spent the evening carving runes into the wall of this Neolithic tomb. And one of the runes was Herman Hardax carved these runes. So uh, we know, so there's definitely a guy called Herman Hardax. And the one beside it was Ingrigeth is the most beautiful woman in the world. But we think that might have been ironic because there was a, a, a drawing of a dog <laughs> written beside <laughs> this one. So we're not sure. So we think Ingrid Geth was, the, was the, 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 the dog that he was obviously very, very fond of. So the Vikings loved the dog as well. Anyway, so we were, he was very keen to go to, to do the Viking, Viking Triangle and the Viking Watch for it. Mm-hmm. So he went into Reginald's Tower and in Reginald's Tower, so we had a lovely tour and they have this great collection of uh, items that had been excavated from the Viking site in carrigan that they discovered when they were building the new road. And of course, there was this fantastic sword, this massive sword that had been kind of ceremonially broken and uh, different personal items that had been buried with this with this chieftain. But of course, the one I was interested in was a dog collar. There's a dog collar uh, in with all these other really valuable items. And I remembered there's, there's also a dog collar had been excavated from the uh, the Viking sh- ships uh, in the Viking Ship Museum at Oslo, uh, where chieftains had actually, th- th- their, their, their longboat had been brought onto the land and they were placed in it surrounded by various uh, valuable items. And uh, in, in that case, there was also a dog collar. So I looked into this a little bit more and found that actually of all cultures, the Vikings were the, the uh, dog uh, remains relating to dogs were found in Viking tombs more commonly than in any other culture. So they obviously had this really strong connection uh, to the dog. And I was thinking then perhaps their, their, their dogs also symbolised their aspirations. You can imagine a Viking. This, this was a fine kind of bronze, very ornate uh, dog collar. And I'm sure the, the um, chieftain uh, it was obviously a very, very important part of his life. Uh, and uh, that set me thinking about how, how we uh, relate to our pets and, and how, how that's changed through the years. OK, I'm going to take a break because there's lots of questions coming in for you. So if you're OK to stay with me uh, while I take this break uh, and I'll be back with uh, William Smith, the vet, after these. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. You are welcome back to the programme. I am still have in studio with me William Smith, vet at City Vets. And they're on Matty's Hill in Waterford City. And there's loads of questions coming in in the interest of fair. I'm going to ask the questions that came in early first when I asked for questions. Um, And this one says, my 12-year-old female Westie is making a noise like cracking her jaws. She tilts her head upwards when she does it. She has become an indoor dog at night time only recently. Any idea what it might be? Yeah, so it's probably certainly mouth pain of some kind and probably related to bad teeth. Uh, Dental disease is really common in all dogs, I suppose, in all older dogs. And uh, that would be one of the signs of it. Uh, that's a sign of soreness around the mouth. So she get her in and get her teeth checked. And that she might need to be knocked out and have some teeth removed, if that's the case. And could she have gotten a bang or something? Probably not. If it's a long-term thing, no. probably not. No, it's okay. probably a, it's probably a t- dental problem. Good morning, Maria. Can you please ask William about my problem with my nine-year-old Bichon Freeze? She started growling at children. She used to growl if there was food involved, but now it's any time, says Deirdre. Yeah, so... That's quite a serious thing. Uh, you need to get it seen to. Uh, dogs do have this progression. They start to show kind of mild signs of uh, dominant behaviour, uh, of aggressive behaviour. And uh, if they're not dealt with early, they progress over time. And eventually she will bite somebody. And obviously when that happens, you're in a very serious and difficult to deal with situation. So you have to, to get help with that before uh, before any, any biting happens. Uh, so you need to bring her to a professional uh, dog trainer and uh, th- those, those issues tend to be quite easy to resolve. It's all about how you interact and how your family interacts with the dog. Uh, but uh, you'd have, have to take that, uh, t- get, get step, steps to get that seen to straight away. And teach your children not to be like at a dog. I know this is like I can say by your face, too, <laughs> maybe not necessarily agreeing with me. But I think it's a good thing to teach children that not all dogs, you can't run up to them and like. Yes, I think, yes, that's very important for, for dogs that you, you uh, for unfamiliar dogs. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's very important because you have no control over their, their behaviour. Uh, but when it's your own dog, uh, there's no need for that. To, obviously, that shouldn't be happening. Dogs shouldn't behave in that way. Uh, it's a sign of where the dog sees itself as dominant. Uh, to members of the family rather than being submissive. What everybody wants is a, a calm, submissive dog. What we think of as a well-behaved dog is a calm, submissive dog. And to get a calm, submissive dog, you have to be a calm, dominant owner. So it's not, in some ways, it's not really so much the dog that needs training. It's the people, it's the owners that need training in how to be calm and dominant. 
Okay, Breda is here in the city and she says, Good morning, Maria. I have a vet question about my four year old pet indoor cat, Lolly, good name. Uh, does an indoor cat need to get the vaccination booster annually? I saw online that indoor cats need to only to be done every two to three years. Is this correct, please? I got her vaccinations for the first three years of her life, but missed last year and will get her done soon this year. Thanks. Uh, Do indoor cats need vax? Uh, yes, probably not. If they have no contact with other cats, they're unlikely to pick up uh, infectious enteritis or cat flu, which are the things we vaccinate against. OK, we've more things coming in now. Just bear with me while I switch screens here. Um, Catherine calls to say she's a lovely pet cat for the past 15 years. Happy, healthy female cat. A few months ago, her cat developed a sore, bloodied nose and since then it has gotten much worse. It's now very nasty looking cut, which seems to be infected even. The cat otherwise seems happy, but it's very nasty to look at. Someone said it may be a cancer, but she brought it to a vet recently and everything was good. Um, can you give any advice? Because it's after getting bad again. Yeah, I'd be quite worried about that one. Uh, if the cat has a pink nose cats with pink noses are prone to a thing called squamous cell carcinoma on their nose which is a type of cancer caused by sunlight uh, exposure to sunlight over time and they're quite difficult to treat Uh, the only way to confirm whether that's true or not is to take a biopsy of the affected tissue so you should bring it to your vet and ask them to take a biopsy of the nose Okay um my seven-month-old, we better do this one quick. My seven-month-old golden retriever has just caught a small bird on the beach while in flight and eaten him. Should I be worried? Well, it depends if you're worried about the dog or the bird. <laughs> <laughs> if you're worried about the bird, then yes. If you're worried about the dog, then no. Uh, <laughs> dogs eat all kinds of things. They've got really tough, tough stomachs. So no, he'll digest that without any difficulty. It might make a few feathers might reappear though. A few feathers might appear at one end or the other (laughs) now. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Would you please ask the vet for tips to introduce a new kitten to an elderly dog who's never been around cats? That's from Lisa. Yeah, I think I I love the way dogs and cats interact, and I I never understand really because there's no particular reason why they should, uh, but they they, they do. They get on quite well. So listen, just do it slowly. I guess the dog obviously the kitten will want to play with the the dog. The dog won't be interested. just give the dog as much space as you can, kind of introduce the, the kitten slowly and let them, sort it, let them sort it out within those boundaries. They, I mean, sometimes kittens can be little balls of ferociousness. Yeah, well, they certainly have... The dog's looking well, at it. Well, they certainly have like, much more energy. I mean, it's kind of like how to introduce a, to- a toddler to your granny. Uh, the, the toddler will want to play and have all this energy and run around screaming and, and, uh, and your, your granny just won't be, won't be able for it. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, give, give them a, a limited amount of time together and gradually increase the amount of time that they spend together over the few weeks. Um, Jackie's been in touch who has a three year old female cat that she's had since she was a kitten she has what seems like abscesses on the backs of her legs and one or two on her stomach can you recommend anything for her? Yeah so that's a, a slightly more good one I suspect from the sound of it if there's, if there's lesions if there are odd looking patches uh, of skin all over the place then it may not be abscesses it might be some kind of skin disease and so cats with kind of generalised, widely spread, odd-looking patches more often would have uh, skin disease rather than abscesses. With an abscess, there'd actually be a hole in the skin and pus or some kind of liquid coming out. Uh, uh, so it may be some kind of generalised skin disease, uh, like with an allergy or with a parasite. Please ask the vet why a Jack Russell keeps shedding hair all the time. That's because he's a Jack Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Do they shed a lot? They shed. They're, they're I would the have worst. thought they're about the, I know. Yeah, they've been short hair. They shed all the time. They're the worst. I think possibly second to golden retrievers, but they shed an amazing amount of hair. And I suppose they tend to be white, which makes them more obvious. Mm. And they've quite coarse hairs, so you can see each individual they're hair. Bristly, aren't yeah, they? yeah, it doesn't just kind of all gather, gather together in a little ball of fluff. But yeah, yeah. Welcome to, to Jack Russell ownership. A final question for you. We have a 13-year-old indoor cat. Recently, she started howling at night and early morning, really loud, waking the whole house. She's not sick. Would you give any idea why she started this? Yeah, sometimes you get uh, senile changes in older animals, both dogs and cats, and they often occur at night. So you get dogs pacing or barking for no reason. And this might be one of those. It might be just that she's a little confused. Uh, and they're quite difficult to, to treat. I guess try and... Uh, uh, keep her as active as you can during the day and hopefully she might sleep a little bit more at night then. Would you give her a feed before she goes to sleep? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Try and keep her keep her more settled at night then, yeah. OK, thanks very much, William. Uh, somebody else just texted in to say, William, one of the nicest people you could deal with. Oh, thanks uh, very, very much. helpful. That's from uh, somebody called Helen. But uh, thank you, Helen. There you go. Now you get Appreciate it. Uh, you. That's William Smith and you find William at City Vets and Matty's Hill in Waterford City. Uh, now it's time to see what Dermot Power has for us. The Days of Our Lives on WLR. Brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care Waterford. When it comes to Waterford seniors, only the best home care will do. Homeinstead.ie 
I was down in the Glen the other day and I must confess a tear came to my eye when I saw the Showboat pub in a derelict condition. In fact, almost all the major cabaret venues of the 1970s are now gone. The Showboat opened on December the 24th, 1974 and closed July 2014. Previous to that, it had been the Glen Bar. It was taken over by Tom and Anna Tracy who transformed it into arguably the best cabaret bar ever seen in Waterford. The first place I played with Simon was Trier's Bar on Barrick Street in the early 70s. It later became Che O'Neill's and has closed after some years with several owners between Che and the time it finished up. The Osman on the corner of Thomas Street and Ann Street was another great popular venue and it was absolutely great fun down there. The main band down there was Gino Hearn and Tommy Casey, brilliant performers. They were called Alias Smith and Jones. The Osman has now closed many years. Paddy Maguire was the owner and was one of the reasons for the Osman's popularity. Catley Lyons' in Sleeve Rue was also another great venue with some wonderful characters who used to come up and do a spot. I remember Wood fellow used to come up and do Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. I remember the first night we played there with Simon. Catley's mother was on the door collecting the money as it was a cover charge. Although we told her we were the band, she said, Oh, it makes no difference. Everybody has to pay. The band has to be played. I also remember when a drag artist called Mr. Pussy was performing there and one fellow was giving him a hard time. Mr. Pussy said, Listen, love, I have a dress out in the car that might fit you, but I doubt if I have enough lipstick to go around your big mouth. That shut him up. There were many, many other great venues, too many to mention, in fact, in Waterford. Those were the days, my friend. Talk to you soon. Days of Our Lives on WLR. Brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care Waterford. Providing the most trusted local home care for your loved ones since 2009. Homeinstead.ie Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. You are welcome back to the programme. Now it's time for Daisha today's regular Awalia slot. Just a reminder that Awalia is a free scheme to help homeowners in mortgage arrears. So you can get free financial, legal and insolvency support and advice from experts. And it's available through MABS, the Money Advice and Budgetary Service. Now Mitchell O'Brien is a personal insolvency practitioner and he's on the line now. This time around the subject is vulture funds. Mitchell, good morning. Good morning, Maria. So... You get that letter telling you that this has happened and I think it puts the fear of God into a lot of people, but should they be scared? Um, not really. They shouldn't be any more more afraid than they would have been because they were in mortgage arrears in the first instance. Um, what, what we need to know is that, that there's a process ongoing here at the moment and the European Central Bank through the Irish Central Bank is requiring all Irish banks to have their non-performing loans, loans in arrears, below 5% of their balance sheet before the end of this year. So by the 31st of December 2019, the majority of non, well, the vast majority of non-performing loans will have been sold. And they, they like this phrase vulture fund. It sounds very like they're going to be absolutely horrible people, all of them. Like what's what's the reality of it? Well, it's a pejorative term um, for sure. Uh, but I mean, the long and the short of it is you still owe them the amount of money and the money is secured on the family home. Um, the same uh, terms and conditions apply. And, you know, if you can get your mortgage back on track, it doesn't really matter who owns it as long as you're paying it. The real issue is, can you pay what's owed at the moment? Um, and if you could, um, your loan wouldn't be being sold. So <clears throat> there are different types of vulture funds um, in the market. Um, like the likes of Mars Capital um, are incredibly incredibly easy for us to deal with. Um, in fairness to Pepper and Start Mortgages, um, 
they aren't quite as difficult as the likes of Link Asset Servicing, um, who are servicing uh, a lot of loans uh, purchased from Ulster Bank. And a lot of the reasons come down to where the Vulture Funds uh, learned their trade. So the likes of, let's say, Mars Capital, Pepper and Start, they have a lot of experience in dealing with family home mortgages, whereas the likes of Link, who are acting for Promontoria, um, they were more involved in commercial debt. And in, in commercial debt, um, you know, it's a case of appointing a receiver and having a fight. Um, whereas that doesn't work um, in context of the Irish regulatory regime for people in mortgage arrears. In Ireland, you have more protections than in any other country in the world if you're in arrears in your, in your family home. And can the bank just do that? The loan is the bank's asset. And the bank can sell that asset to whoever they want. Regardless of how much is left on the mortgage, even? Um, Yes, it makes no difference. I mean, a bank can sell a performing loan as well as it can sell a non-performing loan. But why would a bank sell a performing loan if it's profitable? Um, And and to be honest with you, um, like the recent permanent TSB sales to Len Bay um, being managed by Pepper, um, that was a very unfortunate set of circumstances um, whereby a lot of those loans were re-performing. But because of some technicality with the central bank, the central bank weren't going to allow them to be classified as performing loans. And as such, the bank were forced to sell them. It's all very complicated, isn't it, though? That's why the personal insolvency practitioner (laughs) is there. Um, That's why government will pay the personal insolvency practitioner um, to assist you through the process. So if I if I get the letter, should my the first thing I do would be to call somebody like yourself. That's exactly what you should do, because if you get the letter, there is an underlying issue. And in fairness, the the Irish banks, uh, be it PTSB, um, KBC, um, Ulster Bank, Bank of Ireland, and AIB didn't have the appetite to maintain. The, the repossession processes through the, the circuit courts and the county registrars. They didn't want to be associated with repossessions of family homes. But the vulture funds are a lot less uh, pernickety that way and they will, they will drive on regardless. Um, and so if there was an underlying issue, if you are sitting there at the moment and you have an Ulster Bank loan um, that has been in arrears for a while or you've been through a couple of interest only periods and the bank aren't hassling you, that is a very good indication that your loan is packaged for sale. And if your loan is packaged for sale, you need to consult with a personal insolvency practitioner. You might have a situation where there's very little um, balance left on your loan, Um, but there are arrears. Or for people who are age challenged, let's say they're 60 years of age um, and just don't have enough time left uh, to be able to extend out um, the the mortgage term to reduce payments, um, or if they can do that, the the bank or the fund won't to agree to it. Well, this is where the personal insolvency practitioner, as the independent regulated person, being interjected in between the borrower um, and the mortgage company, can take control of the situation and implement a solution um, on the bank and have it approved by either the circuit or the high court, as the case may be. And because I think, I mean, I think any of us going up against a bank needs somebody in the know at our back because they, they'll they have people. Yes, they do. Yeah. Um, and, and very well funded structures um, and they're very experienced. And, you know, it really is a David and Goliath scenario. I mean, one of the the issues that arose 
on the recent Ulster Bank loan sale, which went to Promontoria and is now being serviced by Cabot Financial, um, was that people, on average, of those loan, those 900 loans that were sold, that each of them had five separate um, alternative repayment arrangements in place with the bank over the last seven years. So any notion that the customers weren't engaging and the arrears problems were there because of strategic defaulters um, was totally washed away with that announcement. Mm. So what we have is honest to goodness people living in homes where they where there is a solution to keeping them in their in their homes, um, but it hasn't suited the banks uh, to provide that solution. So there is the help there and people should avail of it. Yes, uh, I'd, I'd give our number, uh, which is 076-602-7900 or our website is irs-ireland.com or if you just Google Mitchell O'Brien Pip, uh, you'll get our contact details um, and we will assist you. And if there is no cost for our assistance. Um, where there is a family home mortgage in arrears. Um, government is there wanting to help, wanting to pay for that help. Um, all you've got to do is reach out and we will assist. Mitchell, thanks for talking to me. Thank you very much, Maria. Have a good day. Uh, thanks to Mitchell for that. Now, lots of uh, reaction coming in about TV. That's the one that's been exercising you for sure this morning. This texture says, Hi Maria, RTE is broadcasting eight radio stations and four TV channels. Do we need this many? Maybe one TV and one radio station would do and sell off the rest that would save the money and that would cost us less, says Mick in the city. Um, somebody else was saying if Waterford were in the All-Ireland, everybody would have RTE all summer, which is true. Uh, no way would I pay pay for RTE but I'd love to have the option not to pay for it um, there seems a bit of confusion about how much the uh, the uh, orchestras cost this isn't the first time that this amount of money has come in 250,000 a week for two orchestras or a year please tell me it's a year I think it has to be a year uh, but it's just a, an example of the largesse uh, says this texter Hi Maria speaking of repeats RTE had a Mrs Brown's Christmas special last week from Robert um, with regard to subscription to RTE because I was asking you would you um, pay to have just RTE if that was an option absolutely no says somebody um, I wonder how many of those who claim they don't watch RTE will be amongst those that will watch the two night lovely girls competition that's on next week says somebody else Mary says, the only thing I like on television is Home and Away. Wouldn't care if I miss EastEnders. All they're doing at RTE is putting all rubbish on it. There's not a decent thing on television. I love listening to WLR and you should get the money. Woohoo! Thanks very much, Mary. It's the best food just makes my day listening to WLR. Oh, thanks, Mary. Kira says, more and more each night she finds herself flicking past the Irish channels. There's nothing on any of them. Uh, RTE won. She said, had a boring historical documentary on last night at 9.30, which must be prime time after the 9 o'clock news and then there's Virgin Media where everything she says repeats uh, and uh, she agrees it's not worth paying for any of these stations we should be able to pay for what you want uh, to pay for I suppose that's the problem uh, and somebody else uh, saying Maria why do people keep calling children kids I do it so maybe you're having a cut at me I don't know but it's I suppose it's the evolution of language uh, language moves on and words become acceptable and they become uh, to mean something that maybe I know everyone will text in going a kid is a baby goat that's true a kid is a baby goat but these days it's also a small child it's also a child That's it's just language has just evolved like that and that's how we ended up here there's plenty of words whose meaning has changed um, from what they used to mean to something completely different now uh, which causes great amusement in some quarters I can tell you but um, yeah it's, it seems to bother a lot of people but that's just the way it is I suppose uh, that's it for today You have been listening to Daisha Today brought to you in association with Mulligan's Pharmacy the programme is produced as always by Jennifer Long with the assistance of Ashling Boland Thanks for all your texts and comments. We really do appreciate everything. We never get a chance to read them all out, but we do appreciate every single one that you take the time to send to us. So thanks very much for that. I'll talk to you again in the morning. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Jeff's on the way. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.